All right, good morning. Happy Wednesday. Halfway through the week and stuff, so pretty cool. Uh, lots of weird things happening next week because of Memorial Day. And uh, you should have the handout. I can send you a copy if you don't have it. But I do want to talk about here what's all happening. Because normally, if Memorial Day wasn't there, and Memorial Day is cool, don't get me wrong, we would take midterm two uh, next week, Monday, uh, like what would be. But of course, we don't have school that day. So everything is strange. So for section 01, which is what you're in, on Monday, June the 3rd, which is a week from this upcoming Monday, that's when we're going to take the midterm exam. All right. Uh, it'll be at 1.10 p.m. It'll be in 2501, stuff like that. There's nothing really due, though, at the time of your midterm. Because, as I have said, and I want to say it again, next week, Wednesday, which is May 29th, you will be required to be in lecture to turn in the QA1 lab that we did on Monday and also the exam prep 2 worksheet. Exam prep 2 is right after uh, problem set 5 and the companion and stuff like that. So next Monday, nothing's happening. Next week, Wednesday, a week from today, all right, you do have to be here in lecture, and you'll turn in QA1 and the exam prep too. And then when we come to the lab on June the 3rd, the first part will be taken the midterm, and the second part will do the QA3 lab, which is very similar to QA1, just with cooler colors, in my opinion. Um, so like QA1, bring your goggles, no open-toed shoes, and that lab, though, you'll turn in at the end of lab. All right, it's not a lab you have to do any calculations or anything like that for, so you'll turn that in at the end. And then also up here, I wanted to remind you that two weeks from today, so that would be uh, June the 5th, uh, will be another day you have to come to lecture, and you'll turn in problem set six, take home quiz six, and the final exam prep. So it's going to be a busy week here, but nothing you can't handle. And again, this is really kind of an unusual schedule because of Memorial Day. Questions on any of that? If you do have questions, email me. There's no problems and stuff like that. The midterm itself will be similar to the other midterm like we had or other midterms we've had before. 20 multiple choice questions, five short answer questions, two hours in length. There is five points of extra credit built into the exam, too. Um, it's a, just some extra things and stuff you can do. Should be pretty cool. Uh, when I return it, which will either be Wednesday or Friday of the last week. I, I have to kind of see what my schedule is going to be like. Um, anyway, when I return it, there'll be a summary sheet saying how you're doing, stuff like that. So we're coming down to the end. <sighs> anyway, <laughs> sound effects not necessary. Questions? OK, again, if you have questions on anything, there's really no dumb questions because we're going into some unusual things. But it should be pretty straightforward, should be pretty chill. So what we'll do then today is start with an over review of some of the stuff from chapters 15, 16, and 17. And chapter 15 is solubility, KSP, jazz like that, little KF. Uh, chapter 16, entropy, enthalpy, Gibbs free energy. And then chapter 17 is electrochemistry, so cathodes, anodes, that kind of jazz. All right, so let's start off with some questions. <laughs> This is a question where I want you to tell <clears throat> if you think a precipitate will form or if a precipitate will not form, and assume that they're one mole per liter. And after the lab we did on Monday, uh, I'm hoping this will be an easy question. <laughs> but if it's not, we'll talk about it. And I'll tell you a funny story.
group. The group one cations, which is what the focus of lab was on today, are lead two plus, silver plus, and mercury two two plus. And the reason that they are separate from almost all the other metals is that they do have some reactions with chloride, bromide, and iodide. Now, usually those three are aqueous. And most things you add them, they don't make solids and stuff. They just make solutions. But when you're with lead 2 plus, silver plus, and mercury 2, 2 plus, they definitely make a solid. So we added on Monday a lead 2 nitrate to HCl, which is a source of Cl minus, just like KCl. And you should have seen a solid form. All right. So yeah, that's what's going on. So that's the advantage of knowing that these three are exceptions to chloride, bromide, and iodide, because their chloride, bromide, and iodide are around all the time. Uh, Brendan was asked, talk, we were, I was talking to him about uh, bromine earlier, and bromine is neutral uh, bromide, all right? And bromide is a lot more common. Bromine's a little harder to get. There's a lot of bromides, a lot of chlorides, and iodides. And again, most of the time, they're AQ unless they're with lead, silver, and mercury. Now, as a funny aside, <clears throat> on Monday, uh, you saw uh, Brandon and Lana brought this up to me. Uh, you had two bottles of HCl and no HNO3. And I'm glad to say we now have HNO3 back again, which is good. However, uh, one of the people in the stockroom said, oh man, I wonder if one of those bottles has HNO3 and not HCl. Well, I was thinking about that on uh, Monday, and so this morning I did a quick test on the HCl bottles, because each of those little things had two HCLs in them. And what I did is I added lead to nitrate to the quote-unquote HCl. And if it was HCl, you would see a solid, PPCl2. If it was HNO3, you wouldn't see a solid, because there's nothing to make ions. And sure enough, all of the HCl bottles were HCl. <laughs> they all made a solid. So the stockroom didn't mix up the HNO3 and the HCl, and they just space putting it out there, which happens sometimes. So, yeah, practical chemistry. Anyway, the joys that Wednesday's lab will not see that you experienced on that day. All right. Anyway, questions on any of this, Selena's? Good. Okay. <clears throat> now. That's kind of an overall view of solubility that we'll run into a lot. This is a more specific question. And this question says we have barium fluoride with a solubility of 3.6 times 10 to the minus 3. And in chemistry, what that means is if you have a liter of water, you can dissolve 3.6 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of barium fluoride in and not see a solid. So see if you can use that value to find a KSP for this reaction. Think about the relationship of the solubility to KSP for this particular compromise.
outstanding. All right, if you have a question about KSP, it's really important to remember what the equation looks like for a KSP equation. And the solid is the only reactant, and the products will be whatever the ions are that go into it. So for barium fluoride, you'd have barium two plus and two fluoride ions. And solubility, this number right here, again represents the moles of barium fluoride that will dissolve in a liter of water. So I use a lot of times X to represent solubility. And so if X moles of barium fluoride dissociate in water, that means because of the one-to-one -one stoichiometry, <clears throat> you'd have X moles of barium two plus, but you'd have twice as many fluorides because there's a two right there, or two X fluorides. So equilibrium constants, products over reactants, like we've seen, don't include solids and liquids, so the bottom is just one. This would be the barium ion times the fluoride ion squared. <clears throat> and in terms of X, this would be X for the barium, because that's how much barium we've got. You would have two X fluoride, because you get twice as much. But you also square it, so it's like doing double duty here, I guess. But anyway, two squared is four. X squared times X is X to the cube. So what I would do here is solubility literally is that X. So cube the solubility, multiply it by four, and you should get answer D. <clears throat> so the KSP and the solubility are different things, all right? You can get solubility from KSP, and you can turn a KSP into solubility. KSP is a lot more uses than just solubility, so that's why it's separate. Any questions? Sweet. Okay, <clears throat> this is a question you might see. It says, which salt has the greatest solubility, molar solubility, in water at 25 degrees Celsius? And here are three KSP values. So see if you can use those numbers to figure out which one would have the largest solubility. barium fluoride example, we saw that the KSP and the solubility X were related by this 4X cubed equals KSP. And that's what you get when you have one cation and two anions, or two cations, one anion, stuff like that. So <clears throat> we have KSP. We technically don't have solubility here. But if you wanted to find solubility, lead and carbonate are one-to-one. -one. So we'd have X moles of lead and X moles of carbonate. KSP would equal X squared, and you could find X, the solubility, by taking the square root of KSP. But if you look at all of these, <clears throat> lead and sulfide, one-to-one, -one, lead and sulfate, one-to-one. -one. So they all have the same ratio of cations to anions. So you are welcome to find solubility, definitely. But because you do the same thing, Zuntite, to all of these KSP values, you can look directly at the KSP. So if you have the greatest solubility, that means that your solid is most dissolved, like you have the most ions running around. So if you want more product relative to reactant, if you wanted a greater solubility, do we want a big KSP or a small KSP? Big, big. absolutely. 
and you can see that 10 to the minus 4 is a lot bigger than these two right here. So the answer here is lead 2 sulfate. And I didn't technically solve for solubility here. Uh, you could by taking the square root of this number or square root square root. But because this is so much bigger, <clears throat> it will have the bigger solubility relative to the other ones. So I'm using like trends in math and stuff like that. As well, I've actually has some uses once in a while. But anyway, uh, questions on the process? Here's a solution. We have a mixture of sulfite and sulfate. And we can add calcium nitrate, all right? We're adding it as a solid, but the nitrate dissolves really fast with anything. So the calcium will react with sulfite to make calcium sulfite, and it'll react with the sulfate to make calcium sulfate. And if you look at both of these KSP values, they're both less than one. That means that you're going to have a solid form. They'll both make solids, really. But the question is, which one precipitates first? The calcium sulfite or the calcium sulfate? So see if you can think about this and uh, see which one you think is the right answer. So on a problem like this, what I would do, if you want to do it the math way, is I would set up a KSP expression for both of this calcium sulfate and the calcium sulfite. So KSP, as we've seen, is equal to the ion solid. So calcium times sulfate for KCaSO4 is what you do. And the sulfate is 0 0.30, all right? The sodiums and potassiums are just spectators. They're boring. The 0 0.30 would go right there. And you can do the same kind of thing for calcium sulfite, which has a different KSP. That equals calcium times the sulfite concentration, which is 0.10. So we're going to solve for calcium, all right? We're going to get two numbers, all right? And do we want the bigger number uh, to look for if we want the calcium salt to precipitate, or do we want the smaller number to make the solid come out? Small. Smaller, right on, Roy. Right. So when you solve here for calcium on uh, both of them, you want the smaller number. And what that says is that it takes less calcium to make a solid form. So let's pretend uh, this one was uh, uh, one and this was a thousand. It would only take one mole of calcium to make a solid pop out. But if this was a thousand, then it would take a thousand moles. And you're not going to see numbers like that, but that would be the idea. The smaller calcium precipitates first, all right? So that would be the math way to do that. And I'll show it to you here. 
But another way to do this is smaller KSP, less soluble. And there's a pretty big KSP gap between those two. So just by default, I would say this is probably less soluble. Smaller KSP means it's going to be easier to see a solid. And this is not a big KSP, but it's certainly bigger than this one. So this KSP indicates that calcium sulfate is more soluble. So I would also just guess that smaller KSP was less soluble. So for all of those reasons, calcium sulfite should have a salt precipitate first with calcium. Now, here's the math way to do it, all right? And again, what I did down here, I took the KSP for the individual compounds and I divided it by either the sulfate or the sulfite. And you can see that 10 to the minus seventh is smaller by an order of magnitude or so than the 10 to the minus five. So this is a math way to tell that calcium sulfate will precipitate out. But hopefully you're seeing another pattern here too. Almost always, if you have to guess, and I hate to say those kind of things, but it's true, smaller KSPs will precipitate first. Bigger KSPs are going to precipitate later, all right? So that means this one is more insoluble. This one would be yeah, more soluble, I guess. Yeah. Questions on that? Okay. Here's another kind of question that you might run into. Now, same set of conditions. You've got a sulfite and a sulfate, and you're adding calcium. And we saw in the last example that this compound will precipitate first when you add the calcium in. So a common extension of these kind of questions is what will be the co concentration of the less soluble ion when the more soluble ion begins to precipitate? So here's what's happening. You initially start with something that looks like water, all right? And you add a little calcium in, in really small amounts. Well, you start to see calcium sulfate, right? Sulfite, excuse me, right away, all right? But if you keep increasing the calcium, eventually you'll start to see the solid of this one. But if you're hip, right up to this point, you can then filter out the solid calcium sulfite and the sulfite's been removed. So this number should be smaller when this one begins to precipitate out. So that's the idea going on here. Um, see if you can figure out here uh, how this all works. And I'll shut up for a little bit.
All right, so what this question is saying again, we saw that calcium sulfite precipitates first. Calcium sulfate will precipitate in a larger amount of calcium. And the question is, when this one precipitates, how much of the sulfite is left? All right, because the hip chemist, when you get to this point, will then filter out the solid calcium sulfate, and the number will go from 0 0.10 to hopefully number quite a bit less. So uh, up here on the board, I uh, took the original equation that I wrote earlier, which was the KSP for calcium sulfate, and that equals calcium times the initial sulfate concentration. And 8.0 times 10 to the minus 5 molar, that's the amount of calcium you need to make the calcium sulfate precipitate. Now, earlier on the last slide, we figured out the same thing for calcium for calcium sulfite, and it was a pretty small number. I don't remember what it was off the top of my head. You can calculate it, this number divided by 0.1, I think 1.3 times 10 to the minus 7. So anyway, we're going to use this number now in a new expression for calcium sulfite. So same 1.3, 10 to the minus 8, but now we've raised the calcium to 8.0 times 10 to the minus 5, and we just want to know how much sulfite is left. So mathematically, it's not too crazy. You take the KSP, you divide it by the calcium from the more soluble one, and you see at the end there that it comes out to be answer C. Now, why this is cool for chemists, all right, is that we started with 0.1 molar sulfite, and this number says that at this point now we'll be at 1.6 times 10 to the minus 4. And that's pretty cool separation, all right? Um, some chemists have an equation. They figure, well, if you're this amount, that means that it's separated. And I think that's ridiculous. You have to figure out what separation means for your condition. If you're in the environment, maybe this is a bad amount of sulfite. On the other hand, maybe it's OK. I, I honestly, I don't know. But you, as the scientist, have to make those kind of decisions. But at the very least, you can appreciate, first of all, that we did lower the sulfite. Sulfate is still 0 0.30 at this point, but sulfite has went way down. And the second thing I want to keep telling you over and over is that when a person says that it's separated, yeah, it's orders of magnitude hopefully less, but it's not zero. All right, so always keep that in the back of your minds. All right, I'm off my high horse. Questions on uh, anything on this? Here's a question which brings us back to the world of pH. Now, pH was mostly the first midterm, but pH does play a factor when it comes to solubility of hydroxides, all right? So we won't see a lot of pH stuff, but this is a possibility. Now, in this equation, magnesium hydroxide has a KSP. And so the question here, what is the pH of it? So what I would do in this question is find the amount of hydroxide ion that's present from the solubility, et cetera, et cetera, and then minus log of hydroxide will give you pOH, pH plus pOH equals 14, stuff like that. See if you can figure out how that all works.
Okay. So on this problem, we've got magnesium hydroxide, and magnesium hydroxide is in equilibrium with the ions by a KSP expression. You'd have magnesium 2 plus and two hydroxides. So again, all KSP expressions are this way. Solid is the only thing on the reactant side, ions that go into the products. So there are X magnesium 2 pluses coming off for every magnesium hydroxide that dissociates. And you'll have two hydroxides coming off for every one of these. So KSP would be the magnesium ion times hydroxide squared. And the magnesium ion is X, and the hydroxide would be 2X, but you also square it. So like the barium fluoride we saw earlier, KSP equals 4X cubed. You can solve for X, the solubility. When you get X though, do realize that hydroxide is gonna be twice that number. This is kind of like in the, in the lab we did with calcium hydroxide. Two times solubility equals hydroxide, or if you have hydroxide, you divide by two to get to the um, solubility. Um, from there then, hydroxide, you can go minus log of hydroxide to find pOH, and then pH plus pOH equals 14 to find pH. Um, as a quick reminder though, all right, the pHs that are basic, and this will be basic because there's hydroxide, will be something greater than 14. So A and D aren't good answers and stuff like that. Anyway, when I went through all the math, uh, you can see that what I did right here, KSP equals 4X cubed, and I solved for X, the solubility. It came out to be 1.1 times 10 to the minus four. And then hydroxide is twice that number because every one of these that breaks down, you're gonna have two hydroxides. So the hydroxide is 2.2 times 10 to the minus four. Then from this point, you could go minus log hydroxide to find pOH and 14 minus pOH equals pH. I did it the other way here naturally after I talked about that. Um, hydronium times hydroxide is Kw, 10 to the minus 14. So you go 10 to the minus 14 divided by hydroxide to find hydronium and then minus log of that gives you 10.35. Questions on that one. Cool. Another big use of solubility is will a precipitate form yes or no? All right. Now, here's an example of that kind of question, and these are important. Now remember, KSP values are small, but you will have some ions dissolved at all times. And earlier at the beginning of this, I said how PBCl2 is really insoluble. I tested the HCl and stuff with it, for example. However, notice that we have lead concentrations that's not really big and a chloride ion concentration that's not really big. So are we gonna see a precipitate, yes or no? This is a real simple kind of answer. It's either gonna be yes or no. So if you have to guess, I would say yes, because PBCl2 is pretty insoluble but those numbers aren't very big. So what I would do to really nail this shut is I would have lead two plus times chloride squared, basically a Q calculation, and compare it to KSP. If your Q is greater than KSP, you've got a solid. But if Q is less than KSP, you don't have a solid. So see if you can figure out if this will have a solid or not. And again, by default, a lot of times you predict this would, but those are pretty small concentrations. And KSP is not super, super small. So see if you can figure it out. Again, I would use Q equals lead two plus times chloride ion squared.
seeing a variety of answers, which is great. This is a great conversation. <laughs> some people say yes, it'll form. Some people say no, it won't form and stuff, which is totally fine. So let's get to the bottom of it. Let's figure it out. Now, this solution already has the lead and the chloride in it. So you don't have to M1, B1, or V2 it or anything like that. You just use those numbers as is. So what I would do here is put this number in for the lead and this number here in for the chloride and square it. Now, whatever number you get out, if Q, which is what we're doing here, if Q is greater than KSP, you're going to see a solid. PPT is Canvas shorthand version for uh, solid precipitate, not PowerPoint. <laughs> anyway, they're a joke. Anyway, prop that back on. Q uh, greater than K, solid forms. Q less than K, no solid forms. All right? So when I ran this through, I calculated that Q was 1.2 times 10 to the minus 7. And 10 to the minus 7 is definitely less than 10 to the minus 5. So in this set of conditions, you won't see a precipitate. And again, that's a little counterintuitive because usually lead and chloride, they really want to form. But the concentrations are so small here that we don't see it. There is a threshold where solids form. And we haven't gotten to that threshold yet with this set of chemicals. So. This morning when I tested the HCL, I had, uh, I think it was 0.3 molar lead and, I, I, oh, 6 molar HCL. So yeah, I was way above these constants. And so it was easy to see the solid. But here with really dilute amounts, we're not going to see it. So this would be the way to test it. And stuff. Okay. Formation constants are super useful when it comes to complex ions. And complex ions, formation constants, get put in with KSPs a lot in these sections. Um, they are important, they're just kind of annoying. Um, I want you to find the equation for the formation constant of CRCN6 minus 3. We'll talk about how to name that uh, next week, believe it or not. But anyway, for right now, the important part is that these are almost always net ionic reactions. So don't put any spectators in. And the other thing, they're kind of the opposite of KSPs. And what I mean by that, the complex ion will be the product. And anything that you need to make the complex ion will be a reactant. So see if you can use that information to see which of those would be the equation for the complex ion formation constant for this CRCN6-3. So again, if you have a KF expression, the complex ion will be the product, and anything that goes into that will be a reactant. And these are almost always net ionics. Six cyanides would be this part, and six minus one cyanides with an overall minus three means you're gonna have a chromium plus three. That would be the one, so E would be the correct one. Um, this beast is called the hexacyanochromium-3 ion, and we'll talk about that next week. Uh, but I want you to be able to know what you're talking about, not just call it a weird ion, which is what I've been kind of doing so far. That'll be something we'll talk about next week. Um, no net ionics, or excuse me, net ionics are almost always the way, so you won't see sodiums and nitrates and potassiums, weird things like that in there. Questions? Okay. 
Uh, I'll at least talk about this one. If you want to go through it, that's awesome. This is an entropy calculation to find the entropy. And the entropy, these things are always products minus reactants. Make sure that you multiply the chlorine through by two. Uh, if you want to try it, that's fine. We have a few minutes here. We might run out of time, but we should get most of it. So on problems like this, and this can be, this is entropy, but you could do this with enthalpy and Gibbs free energy as well. It's always products minus reactants. And so in this case, you take the CO2 and two times the chlorine, make sure you multiply this by two, and subtract the CCL4 and the O2. Remember, uh, for entropy, everything has a non-zero number. Uh, with enthalpy and Gibbs free energy, uh, O2 would be zero, but with entropy, you've got some kind of number going on. Anyway, if you throw this in your calculator, it comes out to the answer C. It's positive. Uh, if you think about what's happening here, we have one mole of gas and a liquid going to three moles of gas. So not only do you have two moles going to three moles, which entropy loves, but you also have a liquid going to gas. And that's in all those reasons are why this is an increase in entropy. So entropy absolutely gives us a thumbs up. This is a type of a, uh, a, a combustion reaction, but with something kind of nasty, carbon tetrachloride. Questions? Uh, this question, uh, I'll just talk about. You don't have to, if you want to do it, you can. You don't have to. This is the same kind of problem, but with delta G values. Now, this problem would also be products minus reactants. Make sure you multiply things by two where appropriate. But you'll see that there's no O2. That's because O2 for delta G and delta H is zero. So you don't need that value. So you might think, hey, Russell, you're messing with me. No, I'm just, uh, delta G is going to be zero. As well as delta H for the elements in their standard states. So this reaction is spontaneous because it's negative. Good to go. Uh, we will do more of this on Friday. Thanks for being here. Have a great day.